Thank you, Chair. This is the procedure for considering the business this afternoon. The Chair will introduce the application and ask the planning officers to refer members to any late comments or updates received since the agenda was issued. These have been published on the Council's website and hard copies have been circulated to you. After this, the Chair will ask the speakers to address the meeting. Each speaker will have three minutes to put forward their views. There will be a reminder given by the clerk when 30 seconds remain. At the end of the three minutes, members of the committee will have the opportunity to ask the speaker questions if necessary, in order to clarify any points that they have made. Once a speaker has addressed the committee and answered any questions, they will not be allowed to participate further in the meeting from that point. The chair will open up the meeting for questions to officers, a debate by the committee, and finally determination on the application by a vote. The votes will be taken by roll call. Finally, members, this meeting is being live streamed and a recording of it will be placed on the Council's website. Please note that others may choose to copy this recording. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. We'll move to the main item today, which is the application for CALO NED forward stroke 21 forward stroke 00987 forward stroke OL. I will ask the officers to do their presentation. And in line with our normal practice, I'm going to ask that the planning officers will tell us this and that we will have questions when the presentation is at the end of this section. Is that correct? Correct, yeah. Thank you. Graham, are you? I just ask the chair if the screen can be shared so Graham could do the presentation, please. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Adrian. So this item is an outline application with all matters other than access details reserved for up to 36 dwellings at Landoff, Dart Lane, Kalo. The proposal is a major development, including 100% affordable housing, biodiversity net gain and financial contributions. As Chair and members will be aware, a number of late reps have been received and they're included in the late representation pack sent to members prior to the meeting. And the main issues for this application, they're clearly set out in the officer report. And the conclusion of officers is that the benefits of the scheme, including the provision of 100% affordable housing, outweighs the landscape harm in this instance. No statutory consultees have identified any technical reasons as to why this application should be refused. So this first slide illustrates the application site shaded yellow. The scheme before members today is for up to 36 dwellings, all of which will be affordable housing as defined in the local and national planning policy. A single point of access will be provided in the northern corner of the application site onto Dart Lane. And you can see the A632 to the north of the application site. With the application site abutting Dart Lane, Dart Lane, you can see sweeping around the eastern edge and to the south of the application site. Properties on Old School Lane are to the north and northwest of the application site. And you can see the homestead, an individual property, which is kind of in the cutout area to the south of the site. So this is the red line location plan submitted with the application. You can see the relationship with properties a little bit clearer on here with those on Old School Lane to the northwest and those on Dark Lane to the east. So this is the latest indicative site plan, which confirms the extent of the developable area put forward by the applicant. The proposal before members seeks to limit the developable area in line with the current built form of Kalo, which would be in line with properties on Old School Lane and the homestead there to the south. 
A large area of open space, biodiversity enhancement, and surface water attenuation is indicated on this plan. Excuse me. Well, those details will be considered at the reserve matter stage. So this next plan illustrates the proposed access arrangements into the site. Members will need to be satisfied that the proposed works will not have a severe impact on highway safety and the surrounding road network. The access and new footpath arrangements are edged in black, so hopefully you can just make those out. The access and new footpath arrangements you can see will connect just to the north and to the foot public right of way, which kind of backs onto those properties on Old School Lane. As you can see, the plan also illustrates the required exit visibility displays from Dark Lane onto the A632 Chesterfield Road. And the application site and the road along Dark Lane will be over width of 5.5 meters. So yesterday, members who attended the virtual site visit saw a comprehensive range of photos from around the application site. I've just included a few photos here, just as a reminder of the site and the surrounding area. And what I've done is in the bottom right hand corner, you've just got a map of the site and a, an arrow indicating where the photo is taken and which direction it's facing. So this first photo is taken from the entrance of the right of way off Dark Lane. And this is also a bridal way. And you can also see south down Dark Lane. So this next photo is taken from a similar spot adjacent to the right of way, looking back towards the junction with Dark Lane and Chesterfield Road. So this next view is taken from further along the right of way, looking back into the application site. So you can see the homestead property just in the background there, and the developable area will be roughly in line with where the photo is taken back towards the right edge of the homestead. So this next photo we moved around the site and is taken from the public right of way with the application site on the right hand side beyond that hedgerow. So this photo is taken from outside the application, uh, application site, excuse me, looking to the southwest and it illustrates the view across the open countryside. The proposed development will be set well back from this location. So we now move to views from Dark Lane, with this photo taken close to the entrance of the homestead with a list of St. Peter's Church in the background. Properties on Dark Lane, you can just see above the hedgerow on the right-hand side there. So this next photo is again taken from Dark Lane, looking north with the application site beyond the hedge on the left-hand side. And these final two slides are taken from the A632, close to the junction with Dark Lane. This is looking east towards the pedestrian crossing. You can see the traffic restrictions, the WR lines and the crossing zigzag. So park vehicles are quite a distance down this stretch of road. So this final slide is looking west along the A632 with a list of St. Peter's Church on the right hand side. And as you can see, there's a, there's a bus stop close to the site and the footpath is quite wide in this location. And that concludes my presentation, Chair. Thank you. Because we have got such a, a large amount of speakers after this, um, I'm going to ask if there's any points of clarification members would like to ask the officers now before we hear the speakers. There will be time for questions after. Councillor Armitage? Yeah. Uh, could you point out on the map where the settlement development limit is, where it lies? So, Councillor Armitage, hopefully you can, uh, can you see the arrow on the screen? Just. Okay. So, yeah, the settlement development boundary 
I believe kind of extends along here and then cuts across and then follows the southern southwestern edge of Dart Lane and goes behind these properties and then goes to the rear of all these properties on Chesterfield Road. I believe that's correct, isn't it, Adrian? Yep. So, so it's well outside uh, this development is uh, well outside the settlement development limit. As a statement of fact, yes, it is outside the settlement development boundary. Are the trees going to be taken out? Councillor Armitage, this is just for clarification. Questions can come after. You reserve that right. for your questions. This is no sort of marking on if there's a root protection area on the plan. Right. Thank you, Chair. Any further points of clarification? No? Okay. We'll bring the first group of speakers in. Just got a little yellow note here. As we have a large number of speakers on this application, they will require us to operate in a slightly different way. Those wishing to object all are all currently in the executive meeting room, where they are able to view the meeting over YouTube. They will then be brought into the chamber in groups of about five in order to speak and to answer any questions. When everyone in the group has spoken and answered, any questions they will then be taken back to the room and the next group will be brought in. After all those who wish to object have spoken, we will then hear from the agent who will remain in the chamber throughout. Most of those speakers will do so in person, but a few will do so by Zoom. The list of speakers and the running order has been circulated to you all. Has everyone got a list? Thank you. As normal, they'll all be uh, informed that they have their three minutes and then informed when there's 30 seconds remaining. Members will then have the opportunity to ask any questions they have. Good afternoon. I believe the first speaker I have who's on objection is Jason Flaxman. If you'd like to take the table, please. You, it, you can, it, when, you'll have three minutes read, when you're ready, but you cannot give out anything, I'm afraid. No, I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, could you also use your microphone, please, Mr. Flaxman? You might have to angle it up. So three minutes when you're ready. Sorry, your microphone, please, if you just press the button, thanks. Do I have to press that one? Okay, yeah, okay. Right. Can I start again? Okay. I'm Jason Flaxman of Neverly Cottage, Dart Lane, Kalo. My family have lived in Dart Lane for 21 years and my property is directly across the land of the proposed plan application. I'm a resident feels very stressed and upset at this plan application and has caused me numerous sleepless nights. You'll see this afternoon I'm not isolated in my worries and anxieties and following me will be a lot of residents that feel exactly the same. After years of plan applications on Dart Lane, there's been a gas extraction in 2014 and numerous housing development plan applications, which has made us a strong, resilient group. We're fed up with developers looking to make money on our beautiful land. I start my arguments against the proposed development by speaking about the proposed plan application being outside the envelope of the local plan. You can see on my diagram, which I can't hand out, but you can see on the diagram, if you look on the website, it's outside the local plan. It's my understanding that this local plan has been approved by the government and came into effect on November 2021 and does not change until 2034. Being outside the local plan was one of the many reasons the previous application was rejected in 2015. It's also my understanding that there has to be a damn good reason for plan applications to be approved when they're outside their local plan. There is no good reasons. You will see that this afternoon. 
100% affordable housing is not a good reason for this to be passed. Mark Fletcher, MP for North East Derbyshire, also supports our opposition and quotes, I share your concerns for the impact this will have on Top Road and therefore written to North East Derbyshire District Council to outline my concerns for the impact this development will have on the local road infrastructure network. He goes on to say, it must be done in consultation with local residents and it, that it does not have a negative effect on our beautiful countryside, public services and local community. There's been no consultation with local residents. There's been delays after delays with constant changes uh, to the development from the developers. And then suddenly we get seven days notice of the planning meeting. This is not what I would call working with the community. We've had public, we've had public meetings at the community centre and it's been standing room only in opposition to this planning permission. You will see from the representations, there's a lot of negative against it. And, this, and there's not the necessary infrastructure, it will have a negative effect on the countryside. The local MP is against it, the parish council against it, and the local community are against it. And it will certainly not be in the best interest of the local community. Thank you. Thank you. If you'd remain seated, are there any questions for Mr Flaxman <laughs> at this stage? No? Thank you, if you'd like to take a seat. Thank you very much for your time. Our next speaker is, and I do apologise if I don't pronounce your surname correctly, is uh, Jane Sabio. Sabido. Sabido. Bye. <laughs> near enough. Yeah, near enough. Three minutes when you're ready. Okay, I'm Jane from... On top road and the proposed access to and from the development specifically the poor visibility of the junction of dart lane onto top road and the increased number of vehicles entering and leaving dart lane onto top road chesterfield road which leads into top road in Kalo, the a632 is a very busy main road from chesterfield it is also the main route to the hospital from chesterfield and the m1 constantly and it carries constantly carries emergency vehicles to the hospital Top Road has parked cars parked all the way down it, has terrace housing butting up to it and a narrow footpath for pedestrians. Those earlier photos aren't representative of what Top Road is today. This proposed development will clearly add traffic to Top Road and this is in addition to the three already planned and approved developments but not yet built, which was three vehicles onto Top Road as well as the recent Trezvers Gate development already built. This now equates to around 400 extra cars carrying vehicles onto a small stretch of main road. This proposed development application has failed to take into account the severity uh, of the severe re severely restricted visibility from the line of parked cars outside the properties on top road when trying to pull out of dark lane. Within a metre of this junction, there is also a pedestrian crossing, as you saw in the photos, two bus stops, one with no pulling, and a further junction almost opposite, again impeding visibility and creating further safety concerns on a very busy main road if traffic were added. As Highways commented in their original letter on the 15th of September 2021, the proposed development traffic on Dart Lane would struggle to seek gaps to, to turn right to and from Dart Lane and may result in a potential safety issue. And if they're referring to development traffic, then surely traffic from additional residents will also result in potential safety issues. And I cannot see how this can be changed. The additional vehicles from this proposed development will only serve to exacerbate this issue. The impact of traffic from all these developments combined is unacceptable and the Paris Council with highways, agree with Highways' original comments that the pro proposed development of uh, on Dart Lane may result in a, a potential safety issue. Already at peak capacity, adding more vehicles is completely unreasonable. I've not even mentioned the impact of delivery vehicles from new, the new households. And worse is to come when Crow Lane closes, further 30 seconds remaining onto Top Road. In summary, given the additional, uh, the, given the recent housing developments in Cayley, the extra cars joining this saturated stretch of road is totally unacceptable and proposing to add even more is completely bonkers. Add to this the critical ambulance traffic where every second cows and there is the potential for a regular daily disaster. Everyone knows this road is all he already heavily congested. Have any of you tried to travel down it at peak times when an ambulance is trying to get through? That's time, uh, Chair. Approving the development. Thank you. It's just crazy. Thank, Thank you. you. Any questions? If you'd like to remain seated, just in case there are. 
I'm trying to make a quick getaway there. <laughs> I, I mean, you can now. <laughs> Our next speaker, Ian Alcock. Three minutes when you're ready. Okay, my name is Ian Alcock. I live on Gre at Greenbrise Dark Lane. There are currently 43 homes on Dark Lane, and that doesn't include the traveller's site. It's already extremely difficult for residents of Dark Lane to park their vehicles at anywhere near their home. And the situation is, all, is already exacerbated by, by, by the uh, number of residents from Top Row using Dark Lane as their car park, hospital employees using it, Dark Lane as a car park, and also people using the Kalo Church as a car park. Therefore, the proposed development of 36 houses would nearly double the number of houses on Dark Lane, which would therefore nearly double the current traffic issues. North East Derbyshire Council already in, in 2015 rejected uh, building of, of houses on Dark Lane. And one of the reasons were given was because of traffic. And it could be argued that that's, th those arguments are still the same. There's no, nothing has changed except that post-COVID traffic has increased because more people are using online shopping, so the proliferation of delivery vehicles. Also, added to that, in, the, in 2022, the Highway Code placed more responsibility on drivers of larger, of larger cars and larger vehicles uh, and giving them more responsibility. So that could also cause greater congestion. As previously mentioned, at the top of Dark Lane, there's a popular shop called Halo Cobbs. Access to and from Dark Lane onto Top Road is often restricted by delivery vehicles making deliveries to Kalo Cobbs and customer cars, taking up very often the width of the of the uh, of the lane down to my home, which is Green Briars, which is just about the proposed entry exit points for this housing development. So such parking makes exiting the top road of Dark Lane onto Top Road very difficult, especially during school term time. And I understand that whilst the number of traffic surveys have been done. It's my understanding that they've been done in, in school holidays, maybe, maybe, maybe because it's less traffic on school holiday time. Dark Lane is also used as a, as a rat run uh, coming up from the, from the area of uh, Kale Green, which so vehicles will bypass Bowl Hill. That increases traffic congestion both at the bottom of Dark Lane and also the top of Dark Lane. It's further compounded on traffic, certainly on Wednesdays when the refuge collection vehicle tries to access dark oh, lane either up, or, either up or down and that that's and those problems cannot be understated speeding is also addition is also a problem on dark lane especially from the area from the homestead to the top of dark lane and kalo cobs at least one car at least one car has been completely written off and other cars have in fact been damaged because people are using it as a bit of a racetrack i would therefore urge this committee yet again to reject this planning this planning application Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? No, if you'd like to take your seat. Our next speaker is Claire Flaxman. Again, Afternoon. three minutes when you're ready. Yeah. Afternoon. Thank you, everybody. <clears throat> My name is Claire Flaxman. My family have lived on Dark Lane, directly opposite this land for 21 years. I'm angry, upset, and have had sleepless nights caused by the inaccuracies of what effect this development would have on Dark Lane. I'm not an expert on planning, just an anxious mum who was wanting to stop this and protect Dark Lane so future residents can enjoy and love it as much as we do. My reasons for refusal are one, increase of traffic. The access and entrance is situated on the most dangerous junction on Dark Lane. I live there, so I know. The plans totally dismiss and underestimate reality. Two, relationships amongst residents. The development would create a poor relationship with existing residents, parking and traffic issues being the main reasons. Three, it's not called Dark Lane for nothing. It's dark. Dark Lane is dark. We like it dark. We have old fashioned, dimly lit street lighting, creating a peaceful scene. A highly lit housing estate will create bright light shining directly into our properties and windows. I want to take this opportunity to remind you that in 2015, North East Derbyshire refused a similar planning application on this exact piece of land. 
I spoke at that meeting and I believe the council's reasons for refusal still apply today. The council's three reasons were one, the site is located outside the settlement development limit for Kalo. The loss of Greenfield would have a detrimental impact on the character of the area and as an area of open countryside. Its loss is not outweighed by the social and economic benefits as per the local plan. Two, the development would access onto Dart Lane where on-road parking is prevalent and off-road parking limited. Access to the main highway network is already restricted and the additional traffic generated would have a detrimental impact on the existing highway network as Dart Lane is too narrow to accommodate additional traffic. Access from the site to Dart Lane, both north and south, to Tot Road and Kalo Lane, would have an adverse impact on highway safety. The cumulative impact from the development is severe, contrary to the national planning policy and local plan. Third reason, the application is considered unacceptable that Dart Lane is poorly lit and intrinsically dark. The development would introduce streets and other lighting that would adversely affect the local landscape, contrary to national policy framework. For a planning application to succeed, it should be demonstrated that the proposed development should improve an area and the lives of those nearby. This does neither. More accurately, it does the exact opposite. The negative points totally outweigh any reason for yet another housing state in Kalo. Please refuse these plans and put the views of That's the community time, at the heart of your decision. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? <laughs> We're doing well today. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Stuart Ellis. Three minutes when you're ready. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Stuart Ellis from Chesterfield Royal Hospital. Uh, this development would absolutely uh, further add to the significant and growing burden on the hospital of development in northeast Derbyshire and more widely in Derbyshire. Uh, this case is somewhat of a watershed moment for us as your provider of hospital health care to find a sustainable way forward as a partner in Derbyshire. We've worked tirelessly in an effort to support joined up public working for the last three years and consistently meet a glass ceiling of willingness to apply national provisions of section 106, a uh, planning stage and inconsistent information requests across all authorities. The requirement for section 106 was documented to us by planning officers in September as meeting the three tests for this development and accepted by the director of Stantliff. Subsequently, once the number of houses was slightly reduced on the application and the overall funding envelope of contributions reduced, it's now deemed to not meet the tests or to be required, ignoring the clear health impact instead of a reduced contribution for all if this was what was needed. We've provided probably the most robust evidence time after time in multiple formats as to the impact and can evidence both capital and non-capital impacts every development has on the hospital. In responding to increased growth rate and demand in the area in recent years, the new emergency care centre has had to be expanded from its original intention seven years ago, at a cost of almost six million this year, over and above the national contributions. Our MRI scanner at 1.7 had to be replaced early, taking account of demand and the speed of equipment, amongst other things. And these are just examples where development is putting pressure onto patient care. Consequence of this are delays in replacing other equipment, whether it be a gamma camera or ventilator monitoring systems that have to be delayed one, two, or even three years, just as working examples of unsupported development impacts. The local plan, which refers to primary care only, is frequently and misleadingly presented um, as a reason to exclude one of the most costly and critical parts of infrastructure, along with schools and social care from 106 support. This is misleading. The local planning process failed to understand that Derbyshire CCG only act on behalf of GPs, dentists and pharmacies and completely failed to consult with us as a major stakeholder uh, in setting the plan. This doesn't change the legislation provision of 106. We completely understand the challenge planning officers face between delivering housing targets and meeting council pressures, um, but they're also the gatekeepers for the whole system on 106, not just the councils. And this seems to be getting lost to the detriment of the hospital and therefore patients 30 seconds the amendments. Remain. I'd therefore ask that this application is rejected as it stands, as it will directly impact on the hospital. And we've repeatedly uh, evidenced that it meets the three tests in the application we've made. Uh, and our data model is currently being used successfully now that we help develop in Nottingham, Coventry and Warwickshire. Um, possibly a matter for another day to discuss with members, but that's the base of our objection. Thank you. Any questions? No, thank you very much.
You'll now file back to the other room where you can watch proceedings and the next group will be coming in. Thank you. Apparently, you are all here. Uh, the first speaker is Mr. Wells, Chris Wells. Mr. Wells, I believe you are also going to be speaking on with regards for your wife. So I'm going to allow you to speak first, answer any questions, and then speak again for your wife. Thank okay, you thank you. Just so my colleagues know that I haven't totally flipped. Yeah. Now, three minutes when you're ready. Uh, right, I'm Chris Wells. Uh, I live on Top Road. Sorry, I'm darling. Um, air pollution. Top Road is a bottleneck. It has become a natural traffic queue and a, and a stationary traffic generator. This traffic, ge this traffic congestion is a major source of air pollution in Cayo. The minor sources of air pollution occur when motor vehicles are waiting or queuing at the side road junctions on Top Road, Oaks Farm Lane. This will become more 
uh, polluted with the introduction of New Oaks Farm Estate. Lawn Villas, uh, when cars are parked outside the mini supermarket, there'll be delays and difficulty getting out. The exit from the new housing estate behind the, the old post office, that will cause uh, air pollution. And uh, the exit from the school, old school estate onto Top Row causes minor air pollution. But Major, could you turn that fan off, please? It's affecting my hearing. It's, it's an outside. Is it? Sorry. Sorry. The, the major sources of air pollution occur when motor vehicles are waiting or, or queuing for long periods of time at the following side road junctions on Top Road and Top Road itself. The many roundabout linking Blacksmith Lane, irregularly parked motor vehicles on Top Road restrict the flow of traffic on Top Road. It is not possible for two or more large vehicles to move pass in opposite directions because of the parked vehicles. So one stream of traffic has to give way to oncoming traffic. So it comes a race to reach gaps between the rate of traffic flow through Kalo, increasing air pollution. The entrance and exit of both the co-op and hospital car park there will be an accident in this area soon. There is chaos at times with cars wanting to enter and exit both car parks at the same time. And queues are building in both roads directions on top road. There's also problems on Dart Lane, Church Lane and the pedestrian crossing. These sources of motor vehicle air pollution are cumulative to such an extent that an air quality survey was carried out at the junction of Dart Lane and Top Road by Imperial College London on behalf of the World Health Authority. The results of this survey placed this junction in the 50, 51st... 30 seconds national, remaining. 51st national percentile in Amber region, which can lead to the following medical conditions, wheezing, bronchitis, dementia, and Kalo. Kalo, Paul, with, and they, uh, they have to reduce, improve air quality. This pollution has probably contributed to my wife's lung cancer. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions at this point? You've remained seated and now you've got another three minutes. Are uh, you, is that I, it? Can I, can I just point out one mistake in, in, in Graham's presentation? You may. Um, there is a photograph of uh, Kalo Cobbs uh, at the junction of Top Road and Dark Lane. On that junction, it shows two yellow lines. Those are not official yellow lines. There is no blue notice that says that there, are, there is a parking restriction. So technically, those yellow lines are just a, a cosmetic uh, to try and stop people from parking on the corner. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Are you wanting to speak now on behalf of your wife or did your presentation cover it all? No, I can speak. I've got another one from your wife. Just give me a chance to get it out. Oh. Just take your time. Do you have to do this all the time? Yes. <laughs> oh, fewer than all of the That's the Welsh in there. Uh, okay. Drainage and rainwater runoff. In torrential rain, which is more common in the future due, due to global warming, this housing estate has the perfect design to direct the flow of water runoff downhill towards the brook at Bowl Hill which will flood. Little attempt has been made in this planning application to control water runoff or for the land to absorb the excess water and consequently houses close to the brook at Bowl Hill would be flooded. The brook at Bowl Hill would be flooded when heavy water falls on one top road. Um, it just heads straight down because of, because of the downfall. Um, 
Whenever, he, whenever, whenever heavy rain falls on the fields opposite our home, where, home, where it is planned to build 36 dwellings, it nat naturally flows towards the corner near 13 Netherly cottages. It pools there. It also floods the road. Um, this proposed estate is designed in such a way as to direct the flow of water to run off this field down the side of the road towards the road dark lane between uh, the corner of 13 of the cottages and the corner by the homestead. The effect of this rainwater runoff will be worse. There will be greater flow of water which will flood the road and flow through the homestead land. The rainwater runoff will then flow down to Bowl Hill. It needs to be pointed out that there is a large water main flowing diagonally across the field adjacent to Dark Lane, and that this water main would need to be repositioned. This, the field opposite uh, my home on Dark Lane is also contaminated with organophosphate. In the 1970s, farmer, the farmer Sid Smith organized compulsory twice yearly sheep dipping in for his sheep, sheep in this field. Uh, and the sheep dip trough was made available for other local farmers to dip their sheep. Any disturbance of this land through building will come and contaminate more land. This planning application will not provide with the, the proposed drainage mandatory, mandatory for new development 2024. It must have sustainable drainage. 30 seconds remaining. It must have sustainable drainage as grassed areas, permeable services, and wetlands to curb, to curb the flooding and pollution. Incorporate sustainable drainage systems to reduce risk of surface water flooding and relieve pressure on traditional sewerage systems, which can get over, overwhelmed by heavy rain. In other words, it's going to flood. Thank you. Are there any That's questions? It. Thank you. No, if you'd like to take a seat. Thank you very much. Thank you. I believe we have a Mr. Carl Winter who's joining us by Zoom. There he goes. Hello. Yeah, he's back. Hello. Thank you. Three minutes when you're ready, Mr. Winter. Thank you. My main concern is regarding the degradation to our amenity of the emergency services. As you know, we're a small community living on a single track lane with passing places. The residents of this lane have a very varied age range and regularly requires visits from the NHS in particular. This normally arrives in the form of an ambulance, which is very often dispatched from the hospital. Bearing in mind the response times for a category one or two call, are seven and 18 minutes respectively. As the centre of the lane is less than a mile from the hospital, the journey at present is approximately five minutes, meaning even a category one response is likely to be served within an NHS guideline. This greatly helps in creating a more satisfactory outcome to any emergency as the patient will arrive in hospital inside the golden house. We as a community only have two access points to our residences and are very concerned about the degradation of this amenity. With the extra volume of vehicles used in the already restricted entrance to Dart Lane off Top Road, the likelihood of an ambulance having a clear passage to any of our community will greatly be affected. Vehicles can't simply move out of the way as is normally the case due to the nature of the junction and the fact that it is a single track lane, should the ambulance have to reroute due to this congestion. Then any diversion would add, add, sorry, any diversion would add an absolute minimum of two miles and five minutes to the response. This delay would also be on both ambulance journeys and will be greatly affect any of our residents' chances of being treated within the golden hour and ultimately their chances of recovery from a serious accident or illness. All of these facts are based on one, uh, sorry, all of these facts are based on once the premises are in place, if it is accepted. But during the build phase, the damage to this amenity will be significantly greater due to the extra volume of vehicles, both parking in the area and delivering goods, stroke services needed to supply the contractors. 
we would greatly appreciate your consideration of these facts and the degradation it causes to the emergency service amenity provided to our small community. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Thank you very much, Mr. Winter. Thank you. And we have another speaker, Liz Vardy. Three minutes when you're ready. Thank you. Okay. I have lived on Dark Lane for 30 years, opposite the proposed um, site. Dark Lane is a quiet, peaceful, semi-rural, mostly single-track lane, quite unique in its style and character. To introduce a housing estate into this environment would fundamentally and adversely change the character of it. It is an area that is valued and enjoyed by local residents for its character and quiet lane status. The field proposed for development is an historic greenfield site set in open countryside. The fields and majestic trees add to the local environment. This part of Kayla is treasured by local residents who enjoy the rural setting which is within walking distance of everyone in Kayla. It offers local people local access to quiet countryside. These open fields and views support good mental health and well-being, which has been even more important during the pandemic and continued recovery from it. We have seen a significant increase in people walking down Dark Lane and around the fields during and since the lockdowns. Some have even commented to, to those of us that live on the lane that they never realised such a beautiful part of Kalo existed. Being a quiet lane allows local folk to safely enjoy their hobbies, such as cycling, walking, horse riding and dog walking, all so important for everyone's well-being, mental health and fitness. These non-powered road users, including pedestrians, now have priority status over vehicles who, by law, have to give them one and a half metre passing clearance. Visible increase in traffic. There are getting fewer and fewer safe places for horse riders in Kalo, and this is one area that remains a place they can enjoy and use safely. Bringing more traffic onto the lane will compromise this and put horses and riders in danger. North East Derbyshire District Council encourage healthy lifestyle choices, so has a responsibility to make sure areas remain safe. This rural part of Kalo must be retained to preserve the character of this village, which is managing to keep its village identity and individuality in an ever increasingly urbanised area. It should and must be protected for future generations. Just because a green field exists does not mean the only value it has or use for it is to build on it. It is an asset to the village and environment just by being there, particularly in the current global and climate crisis. So in summary, there would be an unacceptable loss of quiet lane status, unacceptable adverse impact on the amenities of the properties immediately bordering the site and the surrounding areas by reason of overlooking, loss of privacy, light pollution, noise pollution and visually overbearing impact. The proposal by reason- 30 seconds remain. The proposal by reason of its sighting would lead to a fragmented form of development being out of keeping with and detrimental to the character and appearance of the area and would be harmful to the open, rural and undeveloped character of this site and quiet lane status. For these reasons, I ask you to refuse this application. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? No, if you'd like to take a seat, thank you. And the last speaker for this group is Jill Hancock. Three minutes when you're ready. Thank you. This is NEDDC Local Plan 2014 to 34. The sustainability appraisal Appendix A only shows two areas for development in Kalo, Church Meadows and 20 houses off Top Road, presumably the Fold. The map clearly shows this and Elk Lane sites as outside the settlement limits. Developments allowed next to boundaries must be appropriate if they are to be built at all. My MP Mark Fletcher and Councillor Jack Woolley are unavailable but have granted me permission to mention their letters. Mark campaigns for affordable housing, but states clearly it must be done in consultation with local residents and not have a severe impact on their lives, community or landscape, which this would undoubtedly would. Councillor Woolley comments that none of these new developments at Kalo get it right when it comes to highways, and they both share our concerns today, which were, are the same reasons for its refusal in 2015. Availability assessment in 2016 allocated 73 new properties in Kalo, a level two CVFLCT settlement, according to the hierarchy, which is more than provided for by Woodall Homes at Travers Gate 30, Church Meadows 45 and Oaks Lane 79. This site offers 100% affordable homes not on open market, 
the key workers, needlessly above the 20 to 30 percent required. A percentage have already been removed from the other developments in Calo, and I worry this will follow suit and this plan is an attempt to get a previously declined proposal approved on a site that is, is, is not suitable. I doubt they will remain affordable forever, as it seems to be the trend. Affordable houses are generally cheaply built and out of character. Key workers have a higher incidence of shift work and at this concentration, resulting in high numbers of vehicle movements in the night as they go on and off shift, disturbing other residents. NED Housing Strategy 2021 to 24 states, everyone has a right to live in a decent home with surroundings to be proud of, a place where people feel safe, happy and healthy to protect the most vulnerable. And this should apply to existing residents, not to just pe people with a need. Dart Lane is a unique gem in a busy 24-7 society, semi-rural where residents enjoy peace, quiet countryside and darkness to truly relax after work, go for a pleasant country walk or horse ride. Horse houses rarely come up for sale here as residents like it the way it is. This development would drastically change this outlook by 100% at Netherley. The local plan was formulated to ensure residents have sufficient access to health facilities, which at present are stretched to capacity and at major crisis point. Sustainability is the inward yet there's no indication these houses will be eco-friendly. Despite local transport links, people will still use cars and turn right down Dark Lane to avoid queues on Top Road, which is a single track lane with one passing place. The nearest secondary school in Haslam means travel by the already congested Kalo Lane. Chesterfield has seen a huge increase in housing in the past two years alone, and with more big developments in the pipeline, surely enough is enough until local infrastructure can support more. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? No, thank you very much. Can I just point out that we as a group... I'm sorry, you've had your three minutes. That this is different. There's only a reason today. And it's about um, the speaking for three minutes. We were informed that we could only speak for three minutes, which included speaking for somebody else. That's, That's why we Mr. Uh, Wells had his time he had two two sops two That's sets of three we minutes told. we were told that we could only have three minutes to include ours and somebody else's that's what we were told and my partner will back me up on that because that's what we were told i'm sorry if there's been any confusion on that uh, what exactly can if you just leave the details or email me afterwards we'll check up on that yeah thank you thank you thank you um if you'd like to go back to your other little room
We're just waiting for uh, a member to rejoin us. We're trying to uh, abate some of the noise issues that we've been suffering from. Okay, um, our first speaker from this group is Annie Wood. You'd like to take the seat. You have three minutes when you're ready. We're living in a time now where you cannot escape conversations about our planet and its future. My family and myself are not alone in being overwhelmed with stress and anxiety on a daily basis, thinking about what our world will look like in time to come, because it's clear from our daily news that on every level, not enough is being done. Part of our climate emergency is not just about reducing carbon emissions, but increasing biodiversity and improving and protecting the environmental aspects of the communities in which we live. We need green spaces for both physical and mental well-being and for the health of our planet. This much is clear because the NEDC has recognised it and it's now written into their climate strategy and their planning. As part of the NEDC's climate strategy, the Council's 2019 to 23 vision is a district that is attractive, where people are proud to live and work, where they will prosper and be safe, happy and healthy. Yet the approval of this planning application will mean that this won't be the case, as it will mean yet another loss of a greenfield site in our village. Moreover, this application is in direct conflict with NEDC's directive of effective planning and management of our green infrastructure to provide access to quality green spaces within our communities. Part of one of the wonderful things about Kalo being what should be and should remain a semi-rural village are what remaining green spaces we have, as they are an amenity for all the residents. Many councils are now adopting green and open spaces strategies, which underscores how important it is to make a stand when it comes to preventing building on greenfield spaces wherever possible. The preservation of the land on Dark Lane will contribute to biodiversity. In fact, there can be no higher net gain for biodiversity than this. Protection enables a sustainable landscape and also makes a contribution to reducing the impact of climate change and help us work towards our climate change targets. Finally, it's part of the NEDC's commitment to enable people to better manage their quality of life, health and well-being and empower com communities to drive sustainable change. Ultimately, our community does not agree with the proposed planning application. And so in line with NEDC's directives, we must be listened to. This greenfield site deserves our protection and we need to consider our people and the planet and the future. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? No, thank you. You'd like to take your seat. Our next speaker, Owen Dowry. Downey. Three minutes when you're ready. Um, the stretch of Dart Lane immediately facing the development site comprises four houses with off-street parking and 13 houses with no off-street parking. Assuming five metres per vehicle, the street parking per street parking space, then one car for each of the 13 houses requires 65 metres of space. Two cars per house requires 130 metres. However, that section of Dart Lane only provides about 120 metres of street parking. Then factoring parking by top road residents, visitors and other parking for people using the allotments, corner shop, etc. It's clear there's already insufficient parking space on Dart Lane. All our local councillors, MP and parish council have raised the issue of traffic and parking in their objections. Sometimes it is people with local knowledge who have a better idea of the real world implications of inappropriate development rather than non-local remote based consultancies that are commissioned by the developer. Following a site visit, the committee gave the following as a reason for refusal of the previous virtually identical development. The development would access onto Dart Lane where on-road parking is prevalent and off-road parking limited. Access to the main highway network is already restricted. The additional traffic from the development would have a detrimental impact on the existing highway network as Dart Lane is too narrow to accommodate the additional traffic and the access from the side Dart Lane would, to the north and south respectively would have an adverse impact on highway safety. In its swept path analysis for vehicles entering and exiting the new development, the transport statement does not account for parked vehicles on Dart Lane. DC high, CC highways do realise this in their response and say that traffic regulation orders are necessary to avoid obstructions from parked cars, i.e. parking restrictions on Dart Lane will be implemented. So we end up in the ludicrous situation that existing residents who have no off-street parking will have their street parking removed in order to allow the new housing to be built. And this new housing will be provided with off-street parking as a base requirement. I cannot see what justification there is for this unfairness and how it will not have a serious adverse effect on the existing residents. In fact, the TS makes no mention at all of the existing car parking on Dart Lane, 
which effectively makes it single track for its entire length. So this must surely introduce inaccuracy into the various traffic predictions and calculations made in the report. Similarly, there is little mention of accidents. The TS acknowledges two incidents in recent years, but as residents, we are aware of many more, plus many near misses. In my own family, my daughter's car was hit and written off by a passing car while it was parked on Dart Lane at the point of the new entrance to the development. Police incidents insurance claims were made. Last year, my son's girlfriend was involved in a collision at the junction of Dart Lane and Top Road, also an insurance claim. Either of these could have resulted in serious injury or worse. If this development is permitted, it's only a matter of time before there are more accidents on Dart Lane. The committee had the foresight to recognise the importance of these issues in refusing the previous application. Nothing has changed with this latest proposal. The new junction is in the same place and there are now more houses proposed. proposed. Therefore, the same concerns previously cited by the committee remain valid for this application. It should be similarly refused. Essentially, this proposal is a square peg in a round hole. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Councillor Hall, if you'd like to Thank remain you. seated. Sorry, I'd like to ask you a question, please. You, yep. you touched upon the uh, reasons for refusal in 2015, yep. uh, citing traffic, congestion, parking, etc. Would you say then over the last seven years that traffic has stayed roughly the same, including parking, decreased or increased? And if it's increased, would you say substantially? Oh, no. Yeah, well, it's hard to tell because there was a dip during the COVID period. Um, but certainly in the last year, as traffic flows are coming back up, I think there's also uh, increased use of the allotments, which, again, that, that sort of increased during uh, the lockdown period. So there's a lot more parking for people using the allotments at the back. Um, so, I mean, and yeah, I'm noticing it, it's increasing. It is, there's been a noticeably increase in the last year. Um, Thank you. Another point on that, though, I would say, in the, in the transport statement, it does assume that vehicles would go 24 miles an hour along that stretch, which we know they don't. We see them go past, and clearly the one that wrote off my daughter's car is going a lot faster. Um, so they do travel on that stretch at high speed. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Karen Haywood. Three minutes when you're ready. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm Karen Haywood of Milltown Ashover, representing the British Horse Society on behalf of local riders. It's ex Hello, I think it's working again now. If you'd like to start again, <laughs> right from the beginning, of okay. right. uh, I'm Karen Haywood of Milltown Ashover, representing the British Horse Society on behalf of local riders. With 696 horses registered at postcodes at Sheffield 44, the annual revenue is worth over 3.88 million to the local uh, economy. There are over 22 equestrian properties within a one mile radius of Dart Lane, Calo, including Brimington Equestrian Centre, several commercial livery yards, plus many private horse owners. The off-road provision for equestrians is extremely fragmented, with only 11% in Derbyshire. Nationally, the figure is 22%. The main off-road route in the area is the Trans Pennine Trail, Greenway and National Cycle Network, but ac access to it is often along busy roads. Dart Lane and Calo Bridleway 8 is an important link to the Trans Pennine Trail for over 12 equestrian properties south of the A632, with approximately 25 riders regularly using these routes to then cross its busy road onto Church Lane and after riding for another half a mile, eventually access the TPT. However, this access is compromised at the present time by one, no road signage on A632 showing horse crossing point, two, poor sight lines at the Dart Lane Junction, three, congested and queuing traffic, both on A632, a narrow junction of Dart Lane, four, riders cannot operate the Pelican Crossing and often wait for pedestrians or cyclists to activate the lights, five, there are often parked vehicles, customers at the local shop, blocking the entrance to the poorly signed bridleway. All of these problems are only set to be exacerbated if the proposed development is passed. 
The new access point is only 20 metres away from the bridleway access, where sight lines for both emerging vehicles and equestrians are limited. And these hazards are set to increase during the construction phase with HGVs and other large vehicles access accessing the site regularly. In mitigation, one, increased signage on the A632 horse crossing on the bridleway do not obstruct the bridleway. Two, make dark lane a quiet lane with a 20 mile per hour speed limit and signs showing pedestrians, cyclists, and riders having priority over motorized traffic in accordance with the new highway code legislation. Sign the passing places to prevent parking. Three, upgrade the Pelican crossing to a Pegasus with new lights operable from the dark lane junction. Four, look to increase the greenway network by the upgrade of suitable footprints. 30 seconds remaining. To bridleway status or creation of new multi-user routes. This will help fulfill policies, national policy planning framework, paragraph 100, Northeast Derbyshire Local Plan ID8 and WC5. The British Horse Society would be pleased to be involved in this process. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? No, if you'd like to take a seat. Our next speaker is Glynis McLaughlin. Three minutes when you're ready. My name is Glynis McLaughlin. Like many other residents on Dart Lane, I chose to reside here over 25 years ago due to the rural character, appearance and tranquility of Dart Lane. The site is adjacent to footpaths and bridleway Increased daily use was evident during COVID and has continued. I fear this will decline due to the noise emitted by the development site. The planning application has been amended several times. Obviously, the developer and Northeast are desperate for this to be granted, even though an unprecedented number of residents have objected. Noise from the initial construction, heavy goods vehicle, plant machinery, in and out of the site together with building work will be a constant daily disturbance. From th 36 dwellings, everyday living noises such as vehicle noise, possible 72 movements in and out of the housing estate, standing vehicles at the T-junction, garden machinery, fireworks, dogs barking, noisy children playing, all of which are alien to the peaceful dark lane area and will be stressful for exi existing residents. Noise can have a significant effect on health and quality of life, causing stress and anxiety, especially for shift workers. Noise can adversely affect wildlife and ecosystems. Noise from the site during the whole process will be heard further down Dark Lane, affecting even more residents. Reducing the number of dwellings to 36 by not using fields two and three, but to increase the green space and provide a pond will encourage young people to congregate there as there is no facilities within Kalo for young people to meet up. This has the potential to cause antisocial behaviour, drinking, littering, football, loud music. The green space is isolated and the pond is a safety issue. There are several equestrian yards nearby who graze their horses in close proximity to the site. The site is adjacent to a main bridleway and presents a major hazard to riders and their horse. Being flight animals, sudden noises can spook them, causing them to bolt, which could result in serious injury to horse and or rider. I understand the need for housing, but Kayla has been subjected to many new developments over the last few years, all on farmland, despite comments raised by the community. The site is obviously a bone of contention and cannot be suitable, 30 seconds remain. Cannot be suitable or sustainable for development. The residents of Kalo will be losing their valued green space and soundscape, which currently benefits the whole community, instead subjected to unnecessary noise and upheaval from this development. I strongly urge the planning committee to listen to what the residents are saying and why they do not approve of this development and, vote, and to vote to reject this application for the harm it will cause. Thank you, are there any questions? No. No, if you'd like to take your seat. And next speaker is Ian Willits. Three minutes when you're ready. Thank you. My partner and I live in probably the oldest house in Kalo. 
built in 1554 and presently, well, currently and always will be on Dark Lane. I wish to raise the subject of the loss of amenity in the form of the relative darkness of our lane, which results in a wonderful clear skies and for stargazing and owl watching. I fail to understand how a development of some 36 houses can be considered on Dark Lane. The extra light generated by 36 properties and the resultant light pollution must be in direct contravention of your own planning rules, especially as it is outside the approved development area. When we applied to Northeast Derbyshire Planning Department for our menage under application 19-000029-FL, it was passed with conditions, specifically condition four, which, has no, which was that no external lighting shall be provided. This was clarified in the section, reason for conditions. It clearly states, to provide obtrusive, to prevent obtrusive light causing a loss of amenity to neighboring dwellings in accordance with policies GS6 and R9 of the Northeast Derbyshire Local Plan and policy GS9 of the publication draft local plan 2014 to 2034. This has now been formally accepted on the 29th of November, 2021. Personally, I fail to understand how we were not allowed any external lights on a menage that is only visible from the second floor of our property behind a 12 foot hedge and not in view of any neighboring properties due to obtrusive light causing a loss of amenity to neighboring dwellings. However, somehow 36 new modern properties their associated vehicle movements and all the required street lighting do not cause obtrusive light, causing a loss of amenity to neighbouring dwellings, especially since within 10 metres and directly opposite this development, there are 20 existing properties that will be direct, definitely have this amenity adversely affected and only have a small hedgerow to try and screen them. This is also only allowed to grow to two metres in height. Remain. This will be even worse for the owners of the homestead, who will be completely surrounded by this de development and its subsequent light pollution. I would be very grateful if you could please consider the obtrusive light causing a loss of amenity to neighbouring dwellings as a reason to decline this development. This is not only a loss of amenity for the residents of Dart Lane and Calo, but also all of the residents of Bowl Hill, Brimington and Haslam that make use of that time, Chair. Thank you. Are there any questions? No, thank you very much. If you'd like to take a seat. May I also say it was my partner that said that we'd been told we could only comment on one subject, even if people had asked for stuff to be... I spoke to Graham on the phone and said that there was a neighbour that wanted something reading out, but was told that I would have to do it in the same three minutes as this. So can I at least leave it for people to read or be considered for a second three minutes? Thank you. If you actually, as a slight consultation here, if you'd like to read the letter. But again, Chair, it would be subject to the same three minute rule. Yes, that's Thank fine. you. Dark Lane has an existing bridleway which joins it within a few metres of Top Lane. Kalo Bridleway number eight is frequently used route with, for many horse riders. The demarcation point of this bridleway is already very difficult to negotiate. There are seven reasons for this. No road signage for, of the joining bridleway, close proximity to top road junction, queuing traffic associated with top road junction, congested traffic trying to enter dark lane, parked vehicle on the bridleway. All of these hazards will be greatly increased by the provision of the development's only access point, which will be within 20 metres of the bridleway access. The issues associated with the proximity of this new development junction 
will also be massively enhanced by the fact that it will be a blind junction for riders leaving the bridleway. This is because a rider will need to keep their horse a metre or two back from the junction, meaning the rider will be approximately four metres back from the road. Due to the existing vegetation and hedge line, neither the horse rider leaving the bridleway nor the driver leading the development will be able to see the hazard. In my opinion, this will create an unacceptably dangerous junction involving three access points within 30 to 40 metres each other. The, in light of the unacceptably increased risk to life presented by any change to this complex junction, I believe the development should be declined. If not, it should be have considered, sorry, if not, it should have certain conditions imposed to enhance, enhance the safety of all road users, whether that be rider, horse or vehicle driver. If this development is passed, maybe the council or development should mitigate the risk to life of the junction will impose by putting new signage up, warning all users of the danger the junction presents, along with yellow lines and hatchings painted on the bridleway access point to prevent dangers associated with the junction being increased even further by illegal parking on the bridleway. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you. If you'd like to take a seat. Sorry, Chair, just before you go, uh, could we have your neighbour's name, please? Yes, it's Ishvan. I can't, I can't say, I can't pronounce his surname. Uh, I'll have to look at it. It's a, it's a Hungarian name. Can I give it you? Can I give it you in a minute? Uh, yes, you certainly. Yeah, it's Kozlowski or something. I'll have to look it up. Sorry. Okay, thank you. If you'd like to go back to the waiting room. Um, could you leave them up? That's okay. If you just email it later on. As I understand it, Chair, it was the same person. So I don't think the yeah, so I don't think there's an issue.
I believe our first speaker for this group is Rebecca Crowley. Three minutes when you're ready. Just hang on one second there, Chair. Slight um, change to running um, order. Okay. Three minutes when you're ready, sorry about that. I object to the proposed development on the grounds that it is detrimental to the mental health of the residents of Dark Lane, Kalo and surrounding areas for the reasons I will outline. Studies prove that when stress becomes overwhelming and prolonged, the risks to mental health problems and medical problems increase and can cause development of mental health issues. Mental health is currently the biggest burden on the NHS, with studies showing one in four people will suffer a mental health issue each year, and it costs the UK economy £118 billion a year. Depression has increased 17% in the last three years and strong correlations can be found between mental health issues and population density. As you can see from these facts, mental health is already a significant problem across the UK. The proposed development on Dark Lane has had a considerable impact on the mental health of the residents of Dark Lane and surrounding areas, myself included. The amount of stress that has been inflicted through this has been immense, and when you add in the concerns of relational factors, such as destruction of local wildlife and environment, the potential loss of the open space, the constant planning associated letters arriving, it's endless, it's anxiety inducing. Many of the residents on Dark Lane moved there because of the peace and quiet and the nature that surrounds the houses on Dark Lanes. It benefits their mental health. They wanted a quieter life. Some people like myself have lived in places with a higher population density and suffered stress as consequences of that. Immersing yourself in nature has proven advantages to mental well-being. The site of the proposed development is used daily for activity by dog walkers, runners, horse riders, ramblers. Studies show that surrounding yourself in nature, either by exercise or by sitting and watching nature positively impacts your mental and physical health. If the proposed development is approved, this is something that we as residents of Dark Lane and the surrounding areas will lose. It's something that we benefit from and utilize daily. If the proposed development meets approval, we residents will also have to suffer the stress of additional noise and traffic while construction is underway. And going forward from the additional people living in such close proximity on roads that are inadequately built to carry the traffic currently, that they receive seconds additional remain. traffic. These are all issues that are affecting the mental health of people on Dark Lane. Whilst we understand a need for development across North East Derbyshire, this shouldn't be at the detriment to people already in the area suffering. The proposed development is inflicting stress and causing mental health problems. In a time where it's difficult to move due to ongoing environmental and economic pressures, please don't make us feel like we need to leave our home. That's our time, Chair. Thank you. Any questions? No, thank you. If you'd like to take a seat. There's been a slight change to your running order as we've got a couple of people not here. So Mark Armstrong. Three minutes when you're ready. I have lived on Dark Lane for over 23 years. A disabled wheelchair needs 100 centimetres to manoeuvre safely on a pavement. A wheelchair plus one pedestrian alongside needs 150 centimetres to manoeuvre. The current pavement on the top of Dark Lane is only 84 centimetres. Therefore, the width of the current pavement will have to be extended, thus causing 
the dark lane junction to be narrowed and even more dangerous than it already is. The plan states there are opportunities to enhance the sense of place along dark lane. Currently, it is half a street and it is felt the proposals may act to enhance the sense, to enhance the sense of it being a street. How ridiculous, dark lane is a lane, not a street and should remain as such. The proposed access, access point T junction will itself become a passing place with vehicles driving into it to avoid the traffic. It will be very dangerous. In the plans, the proposed houses across the top edge of the field will be built under the electricity cables pylons. By law, you have to be 50 metres away or it's a safety risk. I now quote the council's previous reasons for refusing planning on the same side. Nothing has changed since then, so therefore these points remain valid. The application is considered to be unacceptable as the site is located outside the settlement development limit for Kalo as set out in the council's local plan. The loss of the greenfield site would have detrimental impact on the character of the area and as an area of open countryside and its loss is not outweighed by the social and economic benefits of the scheme. The application is considered to be Unacceptable as Dark Lane is currently poorly lit and intrinsically dark. The development would introduce street and other lighting that would adversely affect the locally dark landscape and the amenity of neighbouring property of occupiers. The, de the development would access onto Dark Lane where on-road on parking is prevalent and off-road parking is limited. Access to the main highway network is already restricted. The additional traffic arising from the development would have a detrimental impact on the existing highway network as Dark Lane is too narrow to accommodate the additional traffic. And the access from top from the site to Dark Lane and both north and south to Top Road and Kalo Lane respectively would have adverse impact on highway safety and the cumulative impact and the development would be severe. Please reject this application. Thank you. Any questions? No, if you'd like to take a seat, thank you. We were expecting someone by Zoom, but they don't appear to be around. So we'll move on to the last speaker, the ejections. And I do apologize if I get your name wrong. Pietro. Yeah. Wonderful, thank you. If you'd like to take a seat. Three minutes when you're ready. Okay. My name is Pietro Pireda, resident of Dark Lane. Dark Lane is a single track road. We pass in place with agricultural land and green fields. I've examined the plans and I know the site well. I strongly object to the proposed housing development of Dark Lane. I object for the following reason. The proposed development is situated in a greenfield site bordered by edge roads, roads, trees, and strips of boggy ground, this, which provide habitat suitable for a variety of birds, such as the blackbird, blue teeth, gray teeth, long-tailed teeth, cold teeth, goldfinch, chaffinch, tree and edge sparrows, wood pigeon, truth, and pheasant. Soon of the less common birds are seen in and around my neighborhood, Include greenfinch, colored oak, bullfinch, the lesser spotted woodpecker, little owl, tiny owls, and buzzard. We know that many of these species are at risk and, and decline due to the environmental change and loss of habitat. The fields surround my house, including in the proposed development side, support many of the species I've mentioned. Where the ground is bogging, this provided the right condition for insects and mollusks to thrive. Amphibians, such as frogs, are also not to live in dumps of ground. If this land is developed, it will take away the habitat and the pot potential nature resorts that insects and small invertebrates provide in the animal food chain. 
bats roost and forage on the site and all the fields surround my neighborhood. We know that all bats are legally protected in Britain, but what will be hard to mitigate is the reduction of the moss and other insects they feed up if the development of this greenfield site goes ahead, this break in the food chain will force them to displace elsewhere. Field mice, voles, and shoes are also at risk from this development, as, and as they are hunted often by the tiny owl and little owl, as well as the other birds, these two will destroy the, the habitat. The green fields and the edge roads are an important natural resort for bees, moss, and butterflies, and the food they gather, such as pollen and net. We needed to protect and preserve this unique characteristic of dark lane for the future of our children and grandchildren. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Are there any questions? No, if you'd like to take your seat, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're into our final group now, which is the agent, Katrina Hughes. Oops. Three minutes when you're ready. Can I just correct my uh, surname? It's Hulse. It's okay. Good afternoon, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak in support of the application. The applicant, Stancliffe Holmes, has worked proactively with officers to achieve an acceptable scheme. The main change from the originally submitted scheme is reduction in the developable area of the site, reduction in the maximum number of dwellings to be accommodated on the site from 65 to 36 dwellings, change from a market housing scheme to a 100% affordable scheme. Although the site is located outside the settlement development limits of Kalo, a level two settlement, Planning Commission is sought for a 100% affordable scheme and policy LC3 allows for proposals of this type provided they meet the policy criteria. The applicant has provided detailed evidence to support compliance with this policy. We are all aware of the significant and urgent need for good quality affordable homes across the country and the housing assessment carried out to support this application found over 30 applications for every affordable home that became available in the local ward. There is undoubtedly a serious and su substantial shortfall of affordable homes in the area. The council's housing strategy officer agrees with this, confirming a demonstrable need for affordable housing and therefore provision of a 100% affordable scheme should be given significant weight in the determination of this application. Although there are local concerns in respect to highway safety and ability to safely access top road, the highway authority has raised no concerns with proposals at any point in the application and does not object to the application subject to the imposition of conditions. The appellant has worked proactively with the council and has amended the scheme to limit built form in line with conclusions from the land council's landscape consultant. The landscape impact of the scheme before you today is considered acceptable by both the applicant and the council's consultant. The large area in the west of the site identified as green space will be dedicated to biodiversity improvement and will en en enable a significant uplift in biodiversity value, which is a substantial benefit of the scheme. Derbyshire Wildlife Trust support the gain to biodiversity the scheme offers. There are no technical objections to the application proposal and detailed design will take place at the reserve matter stage. This is a matter which the council has control over. 30 seconds remain. Thereby ensuring that high quality design is brought forward. Overall, the application proposal is a sustainable form of development that complies with local plan and MPPF policies and will deliver significant economic, social and environmental benefits. It will make an invaluable contribution to not only the overall housing requirement, but more significantly to much needed affordable housing. I trust that you recognise the benefits of the scheme and will be able to support this development. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions, Councillor Elliot? Thank you, Chair. Uh, how many people off the dark lane uh, have you spoken to about this application? 
Um, the the applicant sent round um, letters at various stages of the um, proposal, um, setting out what what we were planning to do. We haven't had any sort of public exhibition. Or yes. sorry, chair, that, that's exactly what I meant. How many people have doorstepped the people of Dark Lane about this application? We not, not just letters. We haven't knocked on on doors. Thank you, yeah. Councillor Hall. Yeah, thank you. I was just going to ask, when you talk about affordable housing, is it all for sale or will any be uh, going to like a housing association or anything to rent, please? It, um, it will be uh, managed by um, a registered provider. So it is, is affordable housing in, as set out in the National Planning Policy Framework. And, and we're wanting at least half of it to be for key worker homes. That would benefit you know lo local people like hospital workers so, so when you say 100 percent affordable housing 100 mm percent -hmm. to rent then is that correct or well that's the the the, the exact mix of affordable homes is to be determined but they oh. it has to be in compliance and, and that will be done with your sort of housing officer as to the exact mix of different affordable home products um, available but the, but the applicant is committed to um, delivering affordable homes for key workers. Um, okay, thank you. Councillor Foster. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, my question's around uh, the priority given to NHS and key workers. Mm -hmm. I've read that in the documentation provided by our officers, uh, but it's the first time I've, I've read, unless I've missed it here, that 50% will be targeted towards uh, NHS and key workers. It's the first time I've heard mm -hmm. that 50%. So it will be a question I've got for officers afterwards to see if mm -hmm. that's being provided. Uh, but my question is around what discount will they be given? Uh, I understand mm -hmm. it's 30% that was uh, put forward by the government uh, a couple of years by, by our government. Uh, is that the one you're referring to? Is that the discount that will be given to NHS and key, key workers? Uh, and also, how will that be? How, how will it be done? How will you uh, provide that? So the delivery of the, um, you know, the, the affordable home scheme will be through a registered sort of housing pro provider um, and, and the sort of mechanism for, for delivering that will, will come at, at sort of a later stage. But obviously, you know, this, this scheme that's, that's put forward, the application description is for affordable homes. Um, and, and it may be that, um, you know, when, when the applicant sits down with registered provider and the housing strategy officer, that a slightly different mix um, of affordable homes types, you know, are required at that stage. It, it will depend on, on some need. But, you know, my, my client is committed to sort of delivering, um, you know, a, a good proportion of these homes to key to key workers. I mean, if if, if when, when they do sit down, there isn't, maybe demand for 50 percent it depends or, or that it might be more you know we we don't know at this stage but that that's their commitment because they recognize that you know with the hospital just down the road and and sort of nurses and and, and doctors and other health workers um needing sort of accommodations local area they're committed to sort of providing that chair can i come back uh, yep. Uh, the, the reason I'm asking that detail mm -hmm. is because one of the main things uh, which we'll be considering, that we'll have to give planning some uh, some weight to this mm -hmm. as, a, as a material consideration, and it's how much weight I should give when I come when I make my decision. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if there's not a figure yet, and it's only something that's up in the air at the minute, and no firm commitment uh, of an actual percentage, other than this is the first time I've heard it. And this, this sort of thing does happen from time to time, and you only discover it while you're actually here. So I will be asking officers uh, afterwards what commitment we have received up to now. But if the commitment, as you've said, it is 50%, and, and, and we can, and we can and record that, we know where we're going. Mm -hmm. And also, I'll repeat the other question, which you might have missed, uh, appreciate you might have missed it, is what is the discount that will be given to key workers and NHS? So it's the actual discount. It's 30% yeah. that's been given by the state. That was when the scheme was launched. And you know, well, if it, I, I'm not aware of the discount, I mean, I certainly with the um, affordable market products, it's twenty percent below market price. That that's I think in the sort of definition of the the MPPF. But if 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 
the scheme for key workers is 30 percent then um you know that 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 is obviously you know what what the uh, um my, my sort of client would sort of go along with but all of this could be tied up in the section 106 but in terms of um the, the commitment i'm not i'm not sure about that it's, it's quite important at this very stage when it comes to whether we think this should be a you know we should pass this mm -hmm. and give it planning permission i don't know if the I'd be happy to hear from the chair. But that's that's one of the main considerations I would give it because it's it's mentioned in there as being one of the reasons why we should go against one of our policies that is providing, uh, you know, for NHS and key workers. Mm -hmm. And if it's not, and there's no discount being given, or it's just off the top of your head, it means I would give different, you know, put different mm -hmm. weights on it. I think that makes but, sense, chair. It's certainly yeah. Uh, I'm quite happy if you want to clarify that so we're all aware because this is quite a key point. Am I able to speak? You, you may, if you'd just yeah. like to introduce yourself. Okay. I'm Stephen Jones from Stancliffe Homes. Um, the sources had difficulty explaining this because ultimately the final mix will be determined. A little bit closer to the microphone, please. I'm sorry. Um, she had difficulty explaining this because ultimately the final mix will be determined by the registered social landlord. We will we will engage with we'll call it a, um, a housing association for general purposes, but and they will ultimately decide the mix that goes forward. Some would be for rent, some would be for discount uh, market sales. Um, if there were discount market sales, something in the region of twenty five to thirty percent is what we would anticipate. Um, we see a prime purpose here to engage with um, with essential workers because of the proximity of the of the hospital sites close to the hospital and therefore we, we would anticipate there will be significant demand and therefore we would want to target those and therefore a figure of 50 percent has been put forward because it seems to me seems to us that that's an appropriate mix the final discount and the and, and the break and, and the mix between um discounted sales and 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 um and rent would ultimately be determined by the uh housing association but that but we've given you there the scale of where we would anticipate that that should be. I, I hope that's helpful. Yeah, it's helpful. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. So basically, I think that the outcome of that is anything between 25 and 30 percent for the discount. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. OK, are there any more questions? Councillor Rouse. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. Hi. I wonder if you could tell me, you know, when you say affordable housing, mm. can you put a key figure on that for a property? What would one property cost? Because we have all this thing about affordable housing, but who are these houses being targeted at? Yes, we've heard about the NHS and the people mm. that work there, but we could talk about affordable housing and in very many areas, people say, well, we can't afford those houses. Why are you letting them build? And so, I'm just wondering if you could... So the government policy, and this is not 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 me, but government policy sets out as a, the definition of affordable um, affordable housing is not. It obviously it's the social uh, homes of social rent, and that should be a proportion of 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 what is delivered on the site. There's there's discounted market housing, which is sort of typically sort of 20 to 30 percent below the sort of the market price there's also affordable market rent as well um uh, rent as well which is a similar discounted there's key worker housing so that there is this sort of a range of, of different types of affordable housing product and and, and as the applicants just said and I, and I was trying to explain that the, the registered social landlord it, um, pro housing provider will determine what is required in this area um, so that the, the, the right amount of the different products are brought brought forward. Um, so it, it, it's, it's not as simple as it perhaps was in the past where you had just social rented housing. Um, it, you know, the, the, the affordable home provision the definition has expanded and it is down to sort of um what is needed in this this area and that's for the affordable housing provider along with the council's housing strategy officer to determine the exact mix of those affordable products does that answer your 
I asked you for a key figure. I, I didn't mean the figure of how many, say, rented properties or how many for sale. If I, if we'll say off plot, mm -hmm. I can't, and I come along and I want to buy one of your properties. The affordable housing to me is how much you would, how much is that house going to cost? These aren't for market sale though. That they will all be. Uh, Every uh, single one's going to be rented. No, no, not rented. You, you, but the 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 delivery of them and and the that the, if they're going to be sort of sale um, sold at a, a discount, then that will be sort of all agreed with the. Sort of the um, I would, the, I would really like to see the outcome of that, because we we learn all the time about mm -hmm. different things that are happening with the houses, and I know where I come from. We have had loads of houses built. And they come in and say the affordable housing. We tell people they're affordable housing. People then come back to us and say, well, actually, no, they're not affordable to us. We can't afford those. And that's what I'm saying. You know, maybe I haven't come across the way I wanted to, but it's all about the money to me. You know, I'd probably come along and I would probably be able to afford one of those houses. Never in a million years. And I know that from the, the, the houses that have gone up around where I personally live, what are supposed to be affordable. So whether discounted or not, there's got to be some making of the money, of course, to the builder. So, you know, you know it's not going to be given away. All the figures are going to be factored in. I mean, I, I, that, that's why, as part of the mix, there will be social rented housing. But it's obviously got to be, it, it, there's got to be the proportion of that social rented housing has got to be in line with what's required in, in that particular area. And that, that's the advice that will come from, you know, the housing um, strategy officer and, and it will be sort of delivered through the registered housing provider. We'll just leave it at that one. Okay. Thank you. Are there any further questions? No, thank you. If you'd like to take a seat. I do um, have a, an option for the people, the objectors that are still sat in the room. If you want to stay in the room, you can, or you can join your colleagues in the waiting room. Thank you. Thank you. Before we go into the debate, a short comfort break, five minutes. Let's go. I'm going to say a couple of people are disappearing. <laughs> I could have suggest to members the facilities that end uh, as opposed to that end.
questions to uh, our planning officers. Councillor Armitage, Councillor Foster, Councillor Elliot, in that order, please. Right. Uh, are we ready? Uh, how many houses? Who's got one on? How many houses were there originally? Uh, are there in the planning uh, stage at the moment for Caleb? With all the various ones that have been passed. Uh, Councillor Armitage, it's not really relevant at this stage. We're listening to the, this application. It's not relevant for this application. Thirty-four. They've already had to try for sixty-five. Oh no! Anyway, that's in the open. Councillor Foster. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, question for officers: or two questions. First one is a, a fairly simple one, I'm sure. We heard uh, the chap coming from uh, the Royal Hospital uh, asking us to object um, uh, and refuse this planning application. So it's, a, it's just a advice from planning officers. Should we be taking this into account? Because it's the first time I've come across this uh, from, a, from a hospital where, they, where they'd actually send a rev to say, uh, you know, ob to object. So do we give it weight? That uh, That's the first question. Thank you, Chair. The 106 requirements of the scheme are set out in the report, as, as members will have read. In terms of the specific request from the Royal Hospital, our consideration of that is that the evidence hasn't been provided that provides that definitive support for the scheme. And so in officer's opinion, it doesn't meet the SIL tests. And so we've not included in our consideration of the 106 requests. Just uh, overall, in terms of the 106 contributions requested, all the other requests have been agreed with the applicant other than that sole one from the Royal Hospital. Hopefully that's, that answers the question. Yeah, uh, thanks. It, 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 it's just unusual, that's all, in the way it was put across. You know. uh, anyway, uh, the other question, uh, when it comes to the same questions we put to the, uh, that I put to the agent regarding um, affordable housing, the 100%, the 50% uh, targeted at, at key workers, NHS workers, uh, what do you, uh, I know we've said it's, uh, that's going to be forwarded on at a later stage, but at this stage, uh, it's all good, uh, hopefully receiving that. But to make a decision at this stage, can I ask what uh, you've got, uh, in addition to what's mentioned in the pipe, which I've read, what, what, what else do you have? Do you have anything about the 50%? Do you have anything about the discount that may be offered? Do you have anything at all as officers that we can consider and give, a, give weight to? Thank you, Chair. I'll come back initially, and then if, if graeme has got other elements he wants to add. Um, just in in terms of the, the application, as Councillor Foster says, it's for 100% affordable housing as a, a totality. And in terms of the assessment against your policy, LC3, it would be relevant to the consideration of that policy and how much weight you give to that policy will be for yourself. So as officers, we've given that, I think in the, in the pack, we've said considerable weight. So we've, we've put a lot of weight on that 100% affordable housing. The applicant is also set out within his submissions that there will be this 50% set aside for key workers, NHS workers. Now, in terms of an officer assessment, we don't think that tips the balance in terms of consideration against your policy, because as 100% affordable housing, it would, in our opinion, meet the terms of your policy LC1 as a standalone. However, if you as members wish to place weight on that in your consideration, you would need to then include that in any decision that you've taken. So if you're placing weight on that 100%, but with 50% of that as a for key workers, or particularly for NHS workers, hospital workers, you would need to specify that. We would then need to include that in, I, I would suggest, a 106 agreement. So then that would we would have to find some mechanism of, of meeting that need from within that pool. So I, I hope I've explained that well enough. Officers aren't 
putting weight on that NHS pool. But if members are, and that tips the balance for you in favour of granting permission for the scheme, you'd need to find a mechanism for including that in any decision. In terms of the discount, the MPPF is clear that the discount across all the affordable housing ranges is 20%. So you take the market rate, discount 20%, and I can't help Councillor Rouse in terms of what that market rate is, but that would be something that would be generally assessed by by surveyors or professional as to what the market rate is and then you discount 20 percent of that and that's included in your your pack the issue of 30 percent is i believe reference to the um i hope i've got the terminology right here but the starter homes uh no first homes that is the scheme that's relatively recently been set up by government which is for first first homes but then there's that element for elements of that that are weighted for key workers and and that document talks about 30 percent so again if that was an important consideration for you we would need to make that um assessment although we're, we're getting a number of schemes submitted to us whereby the start the the first homes is an additional element to the otherwise 20% affordable housing that we would normally require as part of residential schemes. So I hope that's that's right and I've explained it sufficiently well. Thank you for that. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Elliott. Thank you, Chair. Adrian, can you tell me how you came to a decision uh, of something like this outside the settlement development limits? Yeah, because I know not a lot of people sat around this table were sat here in 2015 when I was. It may even have been me, but threw it out. Uh, and and that was, for me, nothing nothing at all has changed. you still got the issue with, well, I'll let you answer the other question first, Adrian, and then I'll rant later. The situation back in, um, it was certainly pre-2019, I can't remember the exact date, when the this application was submitted and determined um so the situation was different then you, you had um, an out-of-date local plan there was the five-year housing land supply issue that was considered then in terms of the current application you now have an adopted local plan and you should first of all take decisions in accordance with that local plan unless material matters lead you to a different conclusion and Officers note the issue that Councillor Armitage alluded to earlier on, that the site lies outside the settlement development limits. But the way that your plan is written, in an officer opinion, isn't that's not the end of the story. And you need to take a balanced approach across the development plan as a whole. You shouldn't just cherry pick one element of it and put unnecessarily excessive weight on that one element. You need to balance all the elements and come to a conclusion as to acceptability of the scheme as a whole in accordance with the development plan. And in this instance, in officer opinion, and for example, policy SS1 talks about settlement limits, but it also talks about protecting and enhancing the quality of the settings of towns and villages, the landscape, placing development in sustainable locations where there's good access to um, services, jobs, transport links, et cetera. So in terms of policy SS1, officers have taken that balanced view across those various strands. The policy SS2 then talks about where general development will be directed to, and that talks about directing housing provision to level two settlements, which is where, where Kalo is. And also in terms of policy SS9, which is your countryside protection policies, that is a, a positive policy which says within countryside areas, development will be given permission if it meets a number of criteria. This doesn't, but it doesn't then exclude other development. So that's the starting point for the officer conclusion. We then balance those policies up, taking into account the advice we've been given in terms of landscape harm. And an officer view is that on the balance of those policies, and I'll come to affordable housing in a second if I may, but on the balance of those policies, the scheme in its reduced form is acceptable. We've then, as officers, added weight to that in terms of the 100% affordable housing that is being offered. And you may argue alone that meets your policy LC3 and would allow you to grant permission taking a balanced approach. So I hope that that explains the officer approach to the scheme and our conclusion, weighing all the advice that we've received from landscape advisors and policy colleagues and others. Thanks, Chair. Can I just ask Adrian, 
Adrian, I, I'm quite happy that I, I've taken a balanced approach to it and I haven't cherry picked one item. And like you said, you know, you cherry pick the 100% affordable to, to help with your balance of the situation. And I, I look at SS1 and I don't think that en that enhances any local distinctiveness. In, in, and, and for me, you know, it, the SS9 part of it supporting new housing in, 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 in that part of the countryside don't wash for me either because nothing really for me has changed from the last application. And, and, I, and I could take my balanced view if you wanted me to carry on further with the drainage, the accidents on Dark Lane, the fact that it is actually on that lane where, where the parking is. People need to have a drive down there of an evening when the residents of Top Road and Dark Lane, call it what you may, cannot park outside their own properties because there is no parking and they park in yards and yards and yards away. And, and really, some you know, it's, it's such a narrow place to try and get through and the, there are only passing places. And on the stretch where Dark Lane is, there are no passing places. It purely is a single track road. So I, I have taken a balanced approach and I've worked in driven down that thing all my life so you know i like some of the locals who were speaking earlier and i've got shed loads of what i've written on every person who's spoken today and and i just i just can't support it but thank you very much for your answer yeah chair just just briefly i can just um, come back to catch hopefully i've explained the officer approach to to our conclusion it's for you as a collective as planning committee as to whether you agree with that or whether you put weight on other elements and that that is your planning judgment and your planning expertise which you need to bring to to, um, to to the assessment just in terms of the technical elements happy to to discuss those with you but as far as officers are concerned and the evidence that we believe is before you there doesn't appear to be any technical reason why the scheme isn't acceptable and as i often have the discussion with with members of planning committee in listening to what's been said to you this afternoon you need to be sure that that translates to evidence that outweighs the evidence that is in support of the scheme. So you've heard a lot this afternoon about various issues, parking, um, traffic on top road, etc. But I'd, I'd ask you to be wary of the weight you put on those aspects and you must be happy that you have or can translate that into justifiable evidence, tangible evidence that you can bring to bear should this or a technical reason to refuse the application be tested at appeal. Thank you, Adrian. Any other questions? Uh, Councillor Foster, then Councillor Cooper. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I, I'd just like uh, officers to just uh, cover some doubts I've got about, um, which, which is what I see, development in the countryside. And uh, that, uh, and around policy at LC, three we've got a uh, lc3 there's um i've got my doubts in here uh, as an individual uh, planning uh, member about whether these are, are all met but in particular uh, 1d so what i'm what i'm looking for is is some some confidence from officers that this has actually been met on the surface of it it doesn't feel like it like it has been so if we read lc3 1d uh it speaks later on in 1d are in keeping with the form, size and character of the settlement and local landscape setting. Well, my view of, of everything I've seen is it clearly doesn't do that to me in, in my eyes, but I just wonder how officers could, if, if you could uh, give me some confidence that you feel that when you consider this and giving uh, plan, you know, weight and planning consideration, do you feel, and obviously you must do, but I'm just wanting you to explore that a little bit more, that 1D has actually been met so it is in keeping with the form, size and character of the settlement because LC3, it must meet all those criteria, not one of them. It must meet one to E. It must meet the whole lot for us to uh, override SS9 and development in the countryside. So that, that's my concern, Chair, if, if that makes sense to officers. Thank you. Um, as Councillor Foster has alluded to, yes, we do. I guess we wouldn't have recommended positively on the scheme. But in terms of that, that issue, the site does um, have a close association, in our opinion, with a, a class level two settlement and that it is bound on two sides by the, the settlement development limit. 
In terms of the impact on the, the local landscape setting character of the, the settlement, all those elements, we've, we've sought advice from um, landscape consultants on that and, and we've taken their view into account. And in particular, it's the constrained nature of the housing that's now formed part of the application that has played in our minds in that on the northwestern and northeastern side there is existing housing so there's the development opposite Kalo Church on the northwestern side on the northeastern side there's the development the other side of Dark Lane itself and then on the south eastern corner there's I think there's a property called the Homestead so our view is that the site is constrained within those built built forms and therefore doesn't leak out into the countryside from that general built form and again that's the basis of our consideration. Councillor Cooper. Thank you Chair. I'm not quite sure um, uh, th this is relevant but I'm not sure how relevant at this time but um, Adrian you've just said you, you, you've obviously put a lot of weight and considerable weight on the 100% uh, affordable homes. My question um, is how achievable is 100% affordable homes with only 36 properties and what kind of quality and design would that mean? And the reason for the question is we hear very often how 100% or, or a certain percent of affordable homes is difficult to achieve. And I'm concerned um, that this, if it's passed today, it will just stand there with no development as an outline. The offer of it being 100% affordable housing has come from the, the developer, so that's, that's something that's offered to us. And as we've set out in the report, we've given that considerable weight in view of the, the council's affordable housing provision and the um, identified need for affordable housing across the district, not necessarily in Kayla, but across the district. The if you were to grant permission for the for the scheme this afternoon, you could control the requirement for 100 percent affordable housing through I would suggest probably a 106 agreement is the best way of doing that. And then if the applicant decided for whatever reason 100 percent affordable housing couldn't or, or wasn't going to be provided, he would need to come back to the council seeking to to vary that agreement. And if it were contained within a 106 agreement. There would be no compulsion on the council to agree to that within five years of the agreement being signed and after that formal application would need to be made in any case to alter the agreement i can't however say to you that the scheme if it were granted permission would be developed out but there would be a requirement to start it within the three years as as normal unless you felt an earlier time was important in view of the the issues that you just raised so if you felt it was important it was delivered before three years the normal period you would need to specify that and give reason why. In terms of the design and quality, that would be controlled normally through the reserve, any reserve matters application. So you would retain control over that. Any further questions? Councillor Armitage, do you want to go through? Your... Okay, fine. That's, that's, that's you know, at least 10 minutes of our time. Right, I shall open the floor for debate then. Councillor Liggett. Um, basically, the new head of highways, the first thing I wrote down that he said was um, the way we're looking at things is changing. Uh, we need to think about queuing traffic and carbon reduction uh, and to prioritise pedestrian, cyclists and horses. Uh, then Mr Wells, I think it was Mr Wells, brought up the air pollution issue. He said the Royal College of London had been out and um, that junction was in the amber region, which I found quite horrifying, really, that, you know, I think that's very relevant now. If, if we're going to look at things in a different way and everybody, well, practically everybody that's been in, have mentioned queuing traffic and traffic overload, etc. I think it's something that should be considered. Any other comment? <laughs> Councillor Hancock? Thanks, Chair. I mean, I agree with Councillor Elliot because I'm quite used to that road and you go down there at night and you cannot pass and that's eyewitness evidence, so it doesn't really get any better than that when it comes to challenging what highways of sat at a desk have done. Um, it Again, it concerns me 
because largely, even though we've got a lot of paperwork here and we've had a lot of witnesses, we're, we're looking purely at this access route. And the fact that we haven't got huge amounts of information in terms of what's happening, and it, it's good that we're looking at a potential affordable housing for key workers, but key workers, as one of the speakers said, are going to have a disproportionate impact on the number of traffic because by the nature of their job, they, they can't work from home. They're to in and fro in, which if it was open to general public, that, that would actually counterbalance some of it. Um, so I don't feel comfortable that we've got enough of, of how, where this application is going to make a proper decision today. Um, based on that, there's too many intangibles that could be, might be, let's bring it back to reserve matters. Well, we're wanting a decision today, and I don't feel that we can comfortably make one that would find in its favour. There's nothing here that would say we should breach our own policies because we've got nothing to actually evidence why we should. Um, so, unfortunately, that's where I stand with it. I'm going to throw my two pennies in and really upset everybody. I quite like this um, development. It's a small development. It's not very often we're offered 100% affordable housing. And I know affordable is an open bracket. I know the standard of uh, workmanship and build quality has been raised. Not personally knowing um, anyone relating to Stay and Cliff Homes, but we have had Stay and Cliff development within Wingerworth. Their build quality and layout is superb. And I have no issue regarding that development and the quality that they would deliver. I am struggling. I'm struggling with the access onto this road. I don't often use it. I did it the other day and I've chosen to use it at different times. I do count, take Councillor Liggett's time about queuing. Unfortunately, we queue everywhere because of the traffic that is everywhere. Man does not want to give up his car. I am one of them because it's easier to use, we can't rely on public transport. So hand on heart, I'm going to have to support this application. And I know there's many around this table that probably disagree with me wholeheartedly, but that's my two pennies. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Adrian said, Adrian said about they'd taken a lot of advice from the landscapers and so on and so forth. I'm taking a lot of cognizance of the 19 people who have been and spoken, and not one of them repeated themselves. Every single one brought in a different reason. They all live there. They brought in a different reason why we should turn it down. I personally see no difference. Yes, the local plans change, and we've now got a local plan. And, you know, there are a couple of policies that I'll quite happily quote. But I, I look at that with the people who live there, and I can't hand on heart sit there and say that development's in the right place at all. And I'm not going to put my name to it. So that's, that's, my, uh, that's my feelings over. Thank you. Any other comment? Councillor Armitage? It's, you mentioned uh, the quality of the build and all the rest of it. You were probably looking at open market houses. This, uh, there won't be much profit. Uh, I mean, we've had this before on uh, affordable houses. And time and time again, people have come and said, oh, yes, we're going to do so many affordable houses. And we all think, oh, great, there'll be some affordable houses. Well, it doesn't work like that because there's got to be profit at the end of the day. And they've come back time and time again and said, oh, well, we can't do it. Uh, instead of 20%, we can only do 5% or 10%, you know. And we've already given permission and it's wrong. And here we are. We've already uh, turned this, uh, well, an application down previously. And I can't see there's any difference to this than the other. You're going to lose a greenfield site outside the settlement development limit. I mean, what is the point in having these settlement development limits if we're not going to uh, adhere to them? And I'm sorry, I can't support this application. Councillor Powell. 
Uh, thank you, Chair. Actually, I can support it. Um, as far as the witnesses were concerned, I think um, interesting what Councillor Elliott said, and I would only say that recollections may vary um, because I heard the same thing over and over again and they were throwing the kitchen sink at it, to be honest, um, coming up with anything at all, which had, had no relevance in terms of planning policy um, or the NNPF. Um, I think it was summed up for me by one of the witnesses who said, residents like it the way it is. Well, if we were all to take that attitude, everything would just die, wouldn't it, and wither. Um, so I think this is a tremendous opportunity to have affordable homes, some of the key workers, if necessary, at, at, at a time to be, um, to be decided. So I fully support it. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Foster. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, while we're in debate, uh, I'll mention what my concerns are. My concerns are much like people uh, will, will gather from earlier with my questions to officers. They're still around SS9. And this is where we've got to, uh, what we've got to consider as a, as a committee. It's where we put weight on these separate uh, material considerations and how we put them, uh, how we address them to our policies. So when we look at SS9 development in the, in the countryside, uh, it goes against that policy, but because it's affordable, I still don't feel that the policies of LC3 conditions are met. Now, all of those conditions have to be met. And when you look through them and read, read them, they're clearly not all met. That's, a, that's how I understood it. And that's how I see that. So uh, that's SS9 and LC3. Uh, my other concern is around SDC3, which is landscape character. And in particular, the, fir the first part of SDC3, which is proposals for new development will only be permitted where they would not cause significant harm to the character, quality, distinctiveness, or sensitivity of the landscape. Uh, and for that, this, this clearly does. It's, it's, it's development in our countryside outside a settlement limit. I can see the value that people may put on uh, affordable units, absolutely. And I can see some people will, will, will put that consideration and say it's enough to develop, in, to, to develop in the countryside. My own view is that it's not. Countryside to countryside, it's outside a settlement limit and it breaches both those, um, both SDC3 and SS9. I can see other people's concern around uh, the traffic and uh, the junctions. We've been here before. Uh, there's not enough there for me to oppose it on uh, when it comes to traffic. It doesn't meet the criteria. Uh, for me, that's how I understand it, which is why I'm not willing to um, consider voting and turning down this application on anything, anything to do with traffic. That's how I feel about it. But I feel solely SS9 and SDC3 uh, and LC3. That's that's where I feel uh, my concerns are around. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Hartson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm in two minds with this application, I've got to say, to be honest. Um, I do think it's outside the settlement area. Um, there's no real guarantee on affordable housing. Um, and the, the, the one little element, it's not, I know we need affordable housing, but it's not in the high value area where we need affordable housing. It's a, it, uh, um, Kalo doesn't come into that area. So I'm, I'm struggling with it. Uh, I think there's a few too many ifs and buts with it. Um, uh, from the highways, I was going to look at it from a highways point of view earlier, but from what we've had earlier, it's clear that on highways there's no, we've got no qualm on it at all. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm struggling with the decision. If I'm honest, uh, I'm very fifty-fifty whether it should go through or not. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Any other comment? No, no further questions. So we come to motions. That will explain. Yes, thank you, Chair. Please bear in mind, members, that a motion must be moved and seconded before a vote is taken. If an amendment to a motion is moved and seconded, then that amendment will be voted on first. If a motion is to be moved, which goes against the officer recommendations, then the member who has moved the motion must give the reasons for doing so. The reason for moving a motion against officer recommendations should comprise the relevant planning issues and be supported by evidence as necessary. 
if a motion is to um, if a motion to reject officer recommendations falls, or in other words, it is not passed, that doesn't mean that the recommendations are automatically approved. Rather, you will need to take a positive decision through a further motion in favour of the recommendations or a different course of action. This will be needed to be this will need to be approved by the committee through another vote. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. So a motion. I'm going to throw this on the table and I think I know which way it will go. And that is to go with the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Much, Chair. Thank you. So we're ready for a roll call. Okay, that, Chair. So the motion is to approve officer recommendations. Councillor Armitage? Against. Councillor Cooper? Councillor Elliott? Councillor Foster? Against. Councillor Hall? Against. Councillor Hancock? Against. Councillor Hartshorn? For. Councillor Liggett? Against. Councillor Jones? For. Councillor Powell? Councillor Rouse? For. And Councillor Ruff? For. That's five for the vote uh, for the motion and seven against the motion has fallen, Chair. Okay, the floor's for another motion. Councillor Elliott. Chair, I'm going against officer recommendation. I think it's contrary to policies SS9 development in the countryside. I don't think LC3 outweighs that. I think it's also contrary to SDC3, the landscape character would have been outside the settlement development limit as well. Thank you. Can I have a seconder? Councillor Foster. Chair, can I just, um, before you take the vote, can I just um, come in and ask a, a clarification question, please, of, of Councillor Elliott, if I, if I may. Um, is the issue, Councillor Elliott, just one of, of landscape impact and therefore one reason for refusal, which all three policies would feed into in terms of scale, siting, location, and impact on the quality of the landscape, as Councillor Foster said, or is it two, two reasons, if you like, that and an issue of affordable housing? Sorry, I think the affordable comes into it, but particularly SDC three uh, one is is the main one, and SS nine SS nine and and the SDC three are for me the main points. And the affordable obviously plays into it as well. We've we've not enough information on that. Yeah, Councillor Foster did talk about I think the the issue about LC three. Um, D, which yeah. which talks about local landscape setting. I'm just wanting to, to clarify, it's that one reason in terms of, of landscape, and we can re make reference to all three policies in that respect, rather than anything else to do with affordable housing. Uh, uh, Adrian, yeah, thanks for that. You're saying STC3, one, two, and three. Yeah, I think much, much as the councillor Elliot's mentioned, for me, my concerns are around one. Um, is that is that, that, that the point you mean? I think I may have, and um, quoted incorrectly, I'm, I was um, just making reference to policy LC3D, LC one d Yeah. Um, that talks about local landscape setting. So I'm just trying to clarify that it's it's one reason, which is in terms of the impact on the landscape, rather than an issue about affordable housing. You just want to get it right. So we, we could have one reason for refusal that talks about that landscape impact, and we can reference all three policies. If I can just have a second, Chair, because it's uh, I'm second in the motion, uh, so I'm just going to read this for uh, one moment. Certainly D, which is what I mentioned. So that's LC3, one D. Yeah. It's, it's just getting clarification that, um, if, if I'm right, Kazriel, your concern is regarding scale, form, design, impact, in terms of policy SS9-2. SDC3, which is related to landscape only, and then Councillor Foster's discussion that we had was about policy LC3-1. On, on that chair, uh, to, to the chair, um, when uh, you see, I'd be happy to include others. 
uh, for example, like it can be demonstrated that there are no suitable alternative development locations within the settlement development layer. Now, I'd feel happy to include that, but it may be that officers have received that uh, demonstration. I've not received it and I've not seen it in the paperwork. So I feel uncomfortable about putting that in uh, because it may be that officers have been satisfied that that's been met. Now, I haven't, but you may well have. So that's why I'm having a bit of difficulty with that. And similarly with 1E, it can be demonstrated that the properties will be allocated to those that are in local housing need. Now, it, they might have uh, demonstrated it to yourself, but I don't feel satisfied that it's been demonstrated to me. Now, because of that, I don't feel like, in, I don't feel like seconding uh, to include it because I don't feel, because any decision we make here and put forward that if we do uh, turn this down and refuse uh, permission, it's got to stand up. And, I, uh, and it's got to be defensible. So I'm aware of uh, I'm aware of that. So that's my concerns not to include more than D. Does that make sense, Adrian? And, and just in terms of that, through you, Chair, um, officers have set out in the papers about um, other alternative development sites within KLO, and we we have set out that we're satisfied there aren't any of those. Right. That's and I, I think that um, if, if you're concerned about policy LC three one E, you could control that through your one o six or conditions. So I, I don't. We're not included, so we'll D. Yeah. That's it. Thank so you, it Chair. would just be one one reason which relates to the landscape impact, the setting of the settlement, etc. Are we, are we all happy with that now? Okay, over for a roll call. Okay, Chair, so just to be clear then, and the focus is here uh, on the fact that if the development would be in the countryside and its impact on the landscape in particular, also those issues about the scale and uh, design of the development. Is that the essence of it, members? Okay, on that basis. Uh, uh, Councillor Elliott, you looked a bit concerned. I'm just confirmed that you were happy with that. Oh, I'm absolutely happy with it. Chair. We just discussed it, and it was just a question of whether we were taking out one part of that policy or not. Um, and I'd written already written down that Church Meadows and the Fold were probably the other two that we were looking at maybe the building. I could probably think of them around those sites, uh, but really, it's just been demonstrated or it's been demonstrated to do so. Okay, thank you. If, if I can just add, Chair, maybe um, the uh, the reason for refusal can be delegated to myself in consultation with yourself, so we can make sure we get um, en encapsulate the. Um... Councillor Armitage. For. Councillor Cooper. Councillor Elliott. Councillor Foster. For. Councillor Hall? For. Councillor Hancock? For. Councillor Hartzell? Against. Councillor Liggett? For. Councillor Jones? For. Councillor Powell? Yes. Councillor uh, Rouse? Against. And Councillor Ruff? Against. So I make it eight four and four against. The motion has passed, Chair. Thank you. Thank you all very much for the long haul. Okay, there's only one item. If you want to leave, you may. If you're okay. Switching off, moving to the last part of the agenda today, which is the appeals. Are there any questions on the appeals? And no. just, uh, just raise one point here, yeah, one sure. members um, second, but if um, any members do ask you at, at the moment, we're now sending out appeal decisions to all members to avoid any change in um, the membership. So if any members ask you why they're receiving appeals not in your ward or not related to anything that they can think of in particular it's because we're sending through all so we, we catch everybody so hopefully that's working out chair but i would um as always suggest that members do have a look at the three appeal decisions because they, they do raise some very interesting issues particularly the two in um, that have been dismissed which relate to 
um, the conversion of a building and extensions to buildings in the green belt. So they, they do offer some good pointers to how we determine applications. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And thank you to all for today. I know some of you have been here since uh, 12 o'clock. So thank you for your time and see you at full council. Safe journey home.